morning and welcome to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. Hello, my friend. Hi, how are you? I'm very good. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here with you. We were just talking because I just did this interview with the, the Warner. Right, the and you suggested from, that I read this book, yes, so I'm going to take I, it home. I'm sending her home with it today because I, I think there are parts of it that are really going to sing to you. Okay. I was high, highly recommending it to everybody, and I know... You know, I was saying to people that I think it's a very powerful couples book. But, uh -huh. but uh, and you know, as everybody knows, unfortunately, your husband right. died away. It's almost been three almost years. three years. It's like, amazing. Isn't that amazing that it's I, been that the time long? Because it fashion. seems like it's been 10 minutes in it some does. respect. Although on the other side of it, it feels like a decade since right. we've been able right. to hold read. But I'll tell you something, Nancy. I think there are parts of this book that, I, you know, we did a long time ago when Reed was still hale and hearty. We, mm -hmm. we did a, a 20 minute piece called Facing Fatherhood, yes. where we got a bunch of dads together, and Reed was sort of the um, he. He was like the MC that he would sit and ask the dad's questions, but he would answer them right. too. And it's a powerful, powerful thing. I, we have to get it to somebody because it's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And Reed said beautiful things in it. And there are things that this dad says mm -hmm. in this book because the, the mom first talks and then the dad talks. There are things that remind me of Reed. And okay. I think... I think you're going to find it a really healing book right. in that I'm, respect. Well, I'm um, looking forward to reading it. Yeah, it's really powerful. Um, and you were asking me as you came in, we had our Sensitive Santa event yes. on Saturday. And unfortunately, I don't have pictures to show yet because I was so busy. I took exactly zero pictures. Mm -hmm. We had like four photographers there and a videographer there. And I think next week we'll debut, there'll be a video that we can show okay. of the event. How did it go? It was wonderful and it was lovely and I have to tell you that one of the highlights of it was that we had some guests join us. There were two bus loads of adults that came from a group home oh. to be with us and that, you know, it was so great to be with the little kids. That's always super mm -hmm. fun but to be with those adults mm -hmm. was uh, everybody was talking about it and how right. amazing it was and how we'd all like to spend more time working mm -hmm. with that population. It was so fabulous. It was mm -hmm. just, and I want to say thanks to all the toy manufacturers um, for all the toys that they donated. It was just ridiculous how many toys that we had, and everybody had such a good time. Good. And, and always we have people who cry at the event and say, uh, well, we always have somebody who apologizes, and they, and they go, oh, I'm so sorry that my child, and I always say, did you read The Wall? You're at the We Rock the Spectrum, right. and their motto is the place where nobody has to say they're sorry, exactly. and we're here for sensitive Santa, like this, we especially don't have to apologize exactly. here, and, um, and then people would be like, really? You're okay with the fact that, like, they're not behaving like somebody thinks they should be, right, and we're like, right. yeah, no, it's fine, and, um, the parents who cried and said, I've never been able to get a Santa picture. There was one little boy in particular that has come at least the last three years that we've done it and, and has a brother. The brother's always excited to see Santa, mm -hmm. and this brother wants nothing to do with Santa. Mm -hmm. And each year he's done more with Santa, but not really had a big confab mm -hmm. with Santa, and mm -hmm. he's older now. So we thought, oh, it's going to be okay. And he was like, I don't want to. I don't want to go in there. I don't want to have anything to do with him. And we said, it's okay. We'll try again later. We tried. He was like, I don't want to have anything to do with him. And then um, there was this miraculous thing that happened. There was a brand new baby there. Mm -hmm. I'm talking like three week old baby. Mm -hmm. And the mom came in and put the baby in Santa's arms. Mm -hmm. And here came the little boy. And mm. he suddenly walked up to Santa and he was like, so. And I don't know what it was about holding the baby, mm -hmm. but then he stood there and talked to Santa for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And the mom of the baby was so, she wanted a picture of her baby with Santa, but she couldn't get anywhere near because this child was right. standing there talking. Right. And the mom was like, no, no, I get it, I get it, I get it. While the other mom, the mom of the little boy who's never wanted to be anything to do with Santa was taking so many pictures and going, what just happened? But it was, I get goosebumps thinking about it. It was a really special moment. Nice. Um, just, you know, so Santa, and can I tell you, you know, and he just talked a blue streak to oh, Santa. Good. It was insane. And, of course, Santa was in top form, so proud. Always Santa is in top form. Uh, so, so proud, <laughs> proud, proud of our Santa. Um, 
I he, knows, love, he knows how to interact with those kids, doesn't he? He really does. And I love that one mom came up to me and said, okay, who is that? <laughs> like, <laughs> is that a BCBA? And I said, that is a card-trained dad is what that is. Yeah. That is my husband. Yeah. Um, anyway, I was so proud of him because well, he, he has just gotten better and better and mm -hmm. better at this. Mm -hmm. And to see him interacting with these kids and adults and making the magic happen, I said to him at one point, I said, I have never loved you more than I do oh, now. Sure. And I'm um, going to cry thinking about it. And I love my husband a lot, but I, but I was like, I have never loved you more than I love you today. Yeah, right. It was, uh, it was a great thing. And happy that we could do that. Uh, and that yes. we had so much help to make it happen. Good. Anyway. Okay, um, well, we've got some in the news story, Shannon. Yeah, we do. We do, we do, we do. And I'm going to let you kind of talk about this first story after we introduce it because you have some experience with VR, virtual reality. Yeah. It's being used to help children with learning disabilities and autism. And, this, and there's a great your article. Son Jim has yes. some experience with this. This article came to us from Variety. So you guys can go to variety.com right now and read the full interview. And I thought that it was uh, the full article. And, and I thought that it was really, really interesting, um, specifically talking about uh, a, a particular program. I wanted to say a study, but it's more than uh -huh. that. It's a program that's being done at the University of Kansas's Center for Research on Learning and Department of Special Education. Yeah. They've made a huge announcement. They've announced an investment of $2.5 towards a new program to use virtual reality to nurture social skills yes. in students with disabilities, including autism. And I gotta tell you that I, I think they're right, and I sort of wanna say, my son said it first, uh, last, it wasn't this last summer, it was the summer before last, where my son and I were touring the southern states uh, and visiting card offices in Arizona and New Mexico and Texas. And, you know, we would go and visit with an office, and then we would have, like, an afternoon off, you right. know? And sometimes there was a beach to go to. Uh, well, one place, there was a mall right next to one of the offices. So we went to the mall, and they were demoing VR things. And he'd been after me for months to go to Best Buy to see... Um, Oculus is one of the systems, and he wanted, you could sign up to do a free mm -hmm. demo. And I, you know, who had time to do that? And I said, you know, honey, I get car sick on a stationary bicycle. Right. I, don't, I don't want a VR thing where I'm looking off a cliff. I, you know, I don't need that in my life. And, but here we were, and he'd been doing such a good job, you know, visiting the offices and talking to the families and kids and whatever. I said, okay, this afternoon, whatever you want to do, what do you want to do? I want to go to the mall and I want you to try the VR thing. Okay, whatever. Okay, I said, whatever you want. So we went and did it, and I wasn't car sick. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. And I could see why he liked it. And so then every place we would go, we would go to a mall and try. And there were a couple of different things out there besides Oculus. So we always have Jem working on a thing where uh, positive reinforcement, right? And it used to be that it was different, but now we can we can set goals way in advance and say, hey, you know, here's what we want to see over the mm -hmm. next couple of months. What do you want to earn? Right. And he was getting ready to start high school. And there were things that I needed him to do that were going to be hard. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted him to be on his robotics team. And I knew as a freshman they weren't going to give him much to do. So mm -hmm. it wasn't going to be very reinforcing. So I had to put a reinforcer in place. So I said, okay, he had money that he had saved. He wanted to buy the Oculus. I said, okay, you can buy the Oculus, mm -hmm. but you but I knew he didn't have a computer that would run it. Right. You have to have this big, powerful computer. And I said, here's what you need to do to earn the computer. Mm -hmm. Here's where your grades need to be. Here's how much robotics you have to do. Mm -hmm. Here's how much tutoring you have to do. And man, and it was like a three-month plan, and he did it. So it was uh, almost exactly a year, so it would have been a year ago now, that he we gave him the computer. Mm -hmm. After his finals were over mm -hmm. and he, you know, had gotten great grades and everything, we gave him the big powerful computer. And I thought, what's the first thing he's gonna want to do with it? He's gonna want to set it up at home and do this big VR thing. Mm -hmm. And he's I so I said to him, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to take it to your work and I want to show it to Dr. Grand Pichet. Oh wow. And I said, okay. 
And he goes, I want to show it to her because I think this is how she's going to be able to help teenagers. Wow. Isn't and that... so I said, all right. And so we brought the VR system here to work. And we set it up on a day that we knew Dr. Grand Pichet was going to be mm -hmm. here. And we said to her, you got to come downstairs. Jem has something he wants to show you. I have video of her playing her first VR game and her reaction. Mm -hmm. Have you ever put one of these headsets on in a no, game? No, I was at your house the other night, and like, oh. they were playing with it. And did Wyatt put it on? Did Wyatt, Wyatt did try it? On what did he minute. say? He didn't really react to it too much. He I didn't? Mean, no. He, I wonder which thing they put him in. I don't know. Because they, you are in an environment. Right. And and depending on which game you're playing, I mean, there was one thing that I had to do where I was rock climbing, mm -hmm. and you fall, and, and it, it, you visually are falling, you know what I mean? Um, but they're, each game is different. Mm -hmm. Like one that was really exciting for me, I'm sorry, I'm going to admit to being a geek, it was uh, Star Trek. And you got to be whoever you wanted to be. You're on the bridge of the Star Trek Enterprise, and you run missions. And if you want to, you can be the captain mm -hmm. and sit in the chair and and like you're you're there. Right. Right. You're there. There. Right. It's craziness. Um, but there are all kinds of things that are super fun. Anyway, Dr. Grand Pichet tried it, and she was like, okay, I get it. Uh -huh. uh, then we made a couple of other people here who are influencers uh, at CARD come down, and they were like, okay, we get it. So this last year, CARD started developing programs for oh. VR. And in fact, uh, there are two different things that are being tested in some of the offices. The big one is a program for safety. Mm -hmm. I can't talk too much about it, but it has been amazing. Mm -hmm. And my son over the summer, it was his first real job that he consulted on the VR things mm -hmm. here at CARD, working with CJ Miyake. Did you ever have CJ Miyake on your Not on, your on our team, but I know <gasps> CJ. Oh, he's so lo lovely. He's just one of the top right. people ever. So anyway, uh, please go to Variety, read this article. I think that this is where things are going. Mm -hmm. um, because the funding is not going to be there for teenagers. And you absolutely, if we think about what are the things that make success, uh, and this is a rabbit hole I've been down a lot lately, is like how many hours does it take to be successful at something? Did you know that anybody can become an expert in anything in 10,000 hours? Did you no, know that? No, I did not know that. This is a statistic that's out there. And if you have an affinity for something, you can be, anybody can become an expert in anything in 5,000 hours if you have some innate talent for it. Okay. Like, let's say that you want to be a piano concerto person. Right. It's a 10,000 hour job. Okay. Then in 10,000 hours, you can get to the point where you can play in a concert. Really? 10,000 hours. It's a lot of time. It's a lot. Of time. It's a lot of time. Ten thousand hours is the equivalent of four years of a forty-hour okay. a job, a okay. week job. Uh, but it kind of goes hand in hand with ABA, right? right. That when we're trying to teach somebody something, we need a bunch of hours, mm -hmm. and we can't get enough hours for the teenagers. Partially right. because they're at school, partially because we can't get them funded. Right. But if we could, and and here's the other part: so you have to have a bunch of hours, and it has to be reinforcing. Mm -hmm. So if we could put it in a video game where mm -hmm. it's already reinforcing mm -hmm. and where they will spend more hours doing it because it's reinforcing, mm -hmm. kabow. Okay. Right? Um, and the super cool thing about doing it in a video game is I've been, it's been explained to me, is that you can control the, the variables. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you can be in this environment and somebody can walk up to you and say, hi, my name is Rebecca. And you can shake hands with the Rebecca. Mm -hmm. And she can say, are you here to apply for a job? And you get to respond. If you get it wrong, and then they can rate you and say, here's what you could have done better. And then they can run the scenario again and have you try it again. Think about how amazing that could be for our kids going into the job market. Right. Think right. about the endless possibilities. Right. For it's job training. And for everything. Yeah. For everything. Because it isn't just uh, job training. You could learn anything in mm -hmm. these environments. Because mm -hmm. you, could, you could be in an office environment. There is a right. game where you play office worker. You oh. play office worker. And on the screen, it'll pop up and it'll say, staple the papers to your left. And you have to take them. And you have to find the stapler. And you have to staple them. Uh -huh. And then it'll say, you know, file this um, in, in the alphabet. And it's hilarious because while you're doing it, one of your 
your coworkers in one of your cubicles is throwing paper at your head, <laughs> right? So it keeps you involved in it, but you're learning office skills. Right. But believe me, there's another one where you learn how to be a short order cook. My husband did that one when he tried it. He burned the entire kitchen, <laughs> caught something on fire in the microwave because you have to multitask, okay. right? Anything. Anything, anything. Okay, we're running late on time. Right, but so, so we got to get to our other story. Yes, we have. Um, this has been all over the news lately. Yeah. The death of the 13 year old student at a Northern California private school. Yeah. And basically, they found that the school has violated state rules because the staff put him in a face down restraint position for nearly an hour. And um, here's the thing that's so, super upsetting to me. When this story first broke, the school was saying, we contract with a very reputable company. We follow mm -hmm. the rules. We do all this stuff. We didn't do anything wrong. While everyone in the community was going, how can you take that stance uh, right. so early on in? But as of yesterday, they're saying that, you know, it's, it's relatively clear mm -hmm. that there's nobody who would stand behind putting somebody face down for an hour. No, and, and they did the physical restraint when they were, he was disciplined by a teacher for kicking a wall. And, and I also hate that what uh, the school or originally described him as being six feet tall and around 280 pounds, uh, but medical records show that he was five foot three and weighed only 180 right, pounds. Right, right. Uh, you know, um, th there's a life that has been lost because somebody didn't do, and, and not just one person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the one person, the, the, the people who were restraining him, it's not just them. The buck stops with whoever hired those people, mm -hmm. whoever signed off on those people working with this individual, and people stood around. This is a loss of a life. And I can't imagine what these parents are going through, but I hope that we as a community will rise up and, and say, that this is it. Yeah, this Stop is not here. acceptable. We, 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 you know, this life cannot be lost in right. vain. Let's make this better. Please, please, please. Okay. We have okay. two amazing guests that are going to be with us. We I do. don't know which one is first. Do you? I don't. I don't know whether it's Amy Wadsworth from the Next Work Direct. She's the Next Work Director of the Columbus Community Center. I have a feeling it's her. Is it? It's Amy next. Okay. Yep, Amy next. Amy All right. Wadsworth. All right. So we're, we're going to take be a break. With her. We'll be right back. That we're, was quick. We're so busy. I'm, uh, I'm having such a wonderful time talking to I our guests. I know. Well, uh, we're joined by our guest, who is Amy M. Wadsworth. She is the Next Work Program Director at Columbus Community Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. And Amy attended the University of Utah, took 17 years off to raise her children one of whom is on the autism spectrum before she returned to school in her 40s to finish school and go on to get her master's degree in human development and social policies with a certificate in disability studies. And then she started as a researcher at Columbus and helped to develop the Next Work program from the ground up. So that we really want to talk to you about this amazing program. And Amy, thank you for being with us. Tell us, uh, tell us a little bit of, about what Next Work and what the program is. So the Next Work program focuses on adults with autism, and um, particularly those that are uh, type one, higher functioning, more Asperger's. Um, there's a lot of different ways to refer to it. Um, so they're basically individuals that have autism, but they don't have a cognitive disability in addition to that. So. Um, we work with them to help them find jobs. We also have classes that we um, use to help them to prepare to, uh, to be ready for the workforce. And we provide job coaching once we get them in a job. So we want to you know, help them have longevity and keep the job. Well, and we talk all the time here about how important it is for, for people to be able to have a job and, and, and what comes with that, because I'll be honest with you, I did not realize before, I don't know whether I was just living in a fool's paradise, but I didn't realize how much it meant like, I know people who don't want a job. Mm -hmm. I think we all know people right. who don't want a job. And yet, when I have met individuals on the spectrum, wherever they fall on the spectrum, right. and you talk to them about would they like to have a job, I am always amazed and lifted up by the fact that they want to work. They see yes. it as, a, a like, a right that, that helps to make them, a, you know, an adult. 
Um, and that sort of makes sense to me now, where, where before I just, I guess I was oblivious to it. But um, you must see a lot of this, people who their lives are changed by the ability to be employable, yes? Definitely. Definitely. What are some it's of the, part of, it's yeah. part of your identity, right? Yeah. Right. What are some of yeah. the autism specific challenges in finding a job, Amy? Well, one is um, the networking. You know, I mean, so much of getting a job relies on your social skills. And so they have to rely on something that is extremely challenging for them to even get a job. So we want to help and alleviate that a little bit. So we want to take some of the pressure out of uh, job interviews, out of networking to um, meet new people. We take our clients out on tours of businesses um, where they might want to work so they can get a good idea of what the culture is like and, and see whether they'll fit there. We also want to meet the managers and um, the individuals that they'll be working with so we can better understand how we can help with that cultural transition that they make as they move into work. I'm wondering um, when you, because part of what you do is that you partner with businesses, correct? Yes. And what is the secret to your success there? Because how is it that you're overcoming the fear of employers about what they don't know about autism? Right. I think, well, part of it, I think the stigma is really um, starting to go away. They have a long way to go. But... Um, Especially, Utah is a very interesting place, and you know this since you were here in Provo for a while. Yeah. But um, there's a lot of collaboration, and I mean, this is, you know, we have a lot of volunteerism, and everybody's really interesting or interested in collaborating. And so we have businesses in Utah that are willing to do that, and, and it's part of their culture that they um, – you know, they're changing their diversity, um, their standards of diversity and inclusion, and it's becoming part of corporate cultures in Utah. Now, you offer apprenticeships and internships, is that correct? We, um, so what we do, we have a couple of different programs at Columbus, and one is called the um, Columbus Connect program, and that was not my program, but um, it's, it's a transition program, and we encourage our clients to participate in that program before they come to us. And that program helps individuals to, um, to, you know, when they're getting done with school and they're figuring out how to transition to adult life. And so they do a lot of career exploration and a lot of, um, you know, just trying to figure out what kinds of things that the kids like to do. And so after they, and, and they do get an internship, that's part of that, is that they get um, a two-week paid internship or a short-term paid internship. Um, so that they can figure out what it's like to be in the workplace. And then um, when they come into next work, it's going to be more, it's going to be a longer term apprenticeship, and it kind of depends on the business that we're working with and the relationship that we have with that business. So currently we have a really good uh, relationship with a company here in Utah called Inasys, and they make um, smart lights. So they're, they're lights that you can change the color, um, and you know the warmth the temperature of the of the light and you can also you know fade it so that it's brighter or or uh, dimmer and so we have internships where we can set them up to do the manufacturing of these lights and they learn more about electronics and stuff like that and it kind of lets us know um their aptitude for working with electronics and computers and things i love that i love those lights too yeah, uh, oh, it's great. Yeah, and they're amazing. We're we're actually going to um, have those lights put in our new building, um, which is called the Hub of Opportunity. Yes, talk and, to us about the yeah. Hub. Yeah, so this is our next project. We've actually broken ground already, and it will open next year. Um, in January of 2020, we'll be able to move some people in. And it's a live-work situation, and it's mixed housing. So there will be apartments there. Some of those apartments will be, well, 16 of those apartments are for um, next work clients. And that will be um, our transition academy. So individuals can live there. Um, in the apartments, we'll have a, a residential assistant there, kind of like you would in a dorm. And 
they'll be able to take life skills classes. We'll train them on um, safety, health, um, how to uh, do your finances, and, you know, all the skills that you would need to live independently. And that's a 16-month program. And by the time they're done with that, um, we, we'll have set them up with an internship or an apprenticeship. Um, so, yeah, that, that's really exciting, and it's located right on a transit line. So, um, you know, here in Utah, we've got the Trax um, Transit that goes right along the I-15 corridor. And so it's very centralized, and the location of our um, – of the hub will be right there next to a track station. So we've got great access to transportation. Yes. Right. And, and we'll provide transit training and everything so that these individuals will be able to really experience um, our city. Wonderful. Now, Amy, yes. I'm just curious because we said at the beginning that you have a, a child who's on the spectrum. I, I imagine a young adult uh, by now. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and how much of that influenced you going into this field? Oh, I never would have gone into this field without her. It, I mean, it wouldn't even, it wouldn't even have crossed my <clears throat> mind, <laughs> really. Um, she's, she's a life changer, for sure. And what is she doing today? Tell us how she's involved. So she is more severely impacted with her disability. Mm -hmm. So, and she also has epilepsy, so um, she needs more support. So this program wouldn't work for her. Right. Um, but she's currently getting customized employment services, which means um, she's going through a discovery process. And um, the individual that's working with her, her name is Janet Hellickson, and she also works here at Columbus. And um, she is taking Jessica, Jessica's my daughter, uh -huh. and she's taking her to different locations and, and watching her engage in the community and, and figuring out through observation what Jessica's skills are, which is perfect because she's, uh, she's nonverbal mostly, and, um, but she still has a lot of skills. And so it's, uh, it's great to have her be interacting in the community and hopefully we'll be able to carve out a job for her that will be able to use her skills. Mm -hmm. Because I love Utah so much, and we were talking before that I, I had taught for a period of time in the state of Utah, and you know, so I, and I have friends who, who teach there. So and I so I kind of you know wherever I have friends in a state, I kind of keep track of what autism is doing. And I was always dismayed because for a lot of years, autism uh, Utah was very behind in the field mm -hmm. of autism. That there weren't services, there wasn't a mandate for therapies, there wasn't funding for things. But I gotta say that when Utah got on board, Utah caught up quick. It's actually one of the best states to be in right mm -hmm. now for services because it services across a wide variety for, right. you know, a lot of states don't have something like this in mm -hmm. place for adults, Amy. Mm -hmm. So right. um, I have a strong sense that you've been a part of that catching up. Well, it's been really nice. There's been a lot of synergy in Utah um, with this endeavor. So um, I mentioned I went or in the bio, I mentioned that I went back to school and got my master's degree. And um, my graduate project was actually a book about autism in adulthood. And it was something that, you know, there was so little research on that um, really the only, um, uh, the only research we had to tap into was case studies. And things that individuals who were working in the community already were doing with small, you know, small sets, small, small um, groups of individuals. And so um, that book that we worked on was really groundbreaking. And we had, um, we had some chapters that were written by um, a lot of the, the individuals throughout the country and really throughout the world who are front runners in autism and adulthood. Well, and that well you're teasing us, Amy. Amy, you're teasing what? us. What's the name of the book? Oh, well, <laughs> you know what? Let me go grab it. I can't think off the top of my head what it is. Hang on. <laughs> that's that's when, when you know you're busy, when you can't think of the name of the book that you wrote. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have too many things in my head right now, I that's guess. That's right. Um, so it's called Autism Spectrum Disorder in Mid and Later Life. So there it is right there. There we go. And uh, Scott Wright was my mentor. Bad. And um, so this book, I mean, we've got, I, I didn't 
I wasn't intending to pitch the book, but I'm going to now. Um, yeah, so we've got, you know, Amanda Bakian, who is a researcher, Hillary Kuhn, um, there, uh, Temple Grandin wrote a chapter, uh, Judy Endow, who I don't know if you're familiar with her, but yes. she does blog. Yeah. I'm friends with um, Judy. So she has a chapter in there, and um, we also have an organization here called Optimizing Autism, and it was created by autists for autists. And um, the gentleman that runs that, his name is Elliot Francis, and he's just amazing. He's, he's an autist, and he, um, his ability to explain and describe his, um, his experiences and the way that he sees the world is just, it's very enlightening. It's so fun to listen to him talk, and it gives you a whole new perspective on on autism and, and how... So where do we get the book? So what? Where do we get the book? Um, you can get it on Amazon. Fabulous. It was published in England, so... Um, well, actually, Philadelphia, but Jessica Kingsley is the publisher. Right. We love so publisher. They're based in England. So. Fabulous. And anyway. Amy, how can people get in touch with you with the next work program? Um, so we're still updating our website. Um, we are... You know, we're growing like crazy. The program is only three years old, and that was um, back when we were still researching and trying to figure out how we wanted, you know, what elements we wanted in the program. So, um, but the website for Columbus is Columbus, it's www.columbusserves.org. Okay. And um, we're under community employment. So that's where my contact information is. Um, and yeah, you can email me or, and I can give you my email address right now if you'd like. Okay, sure. It's up to you. Okay, it's A Wadsworth, and that's W A D S W O R T H, at columbusserve.org. So they can contact you to find out more about the Next Work program. Thank yes. you so much for the work that you're doing in Utah. Oh, thank you. We're, we're thrilled. It's great. All right, we'll look right, forward to you, talking Amy. to you again. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Okay, we've got another guest because we're not done yet. No, Susan we're not. Cabot, who is the author of this book, Setting Up Classroom Spaces That Support Students with Autism Spectrum Disorder. Love it. So we're going to be back with her after these messages. Don't go away. Stay with us. And we are back with Let's Talk Autism. And now we are joined by Susan Cabot. Uh, Susan is the executive director of the Autism Institute at the Mailman Siegel Center for Human Development at Nova Southeastern University. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. And you have a, if I were to go through your bio, it's, it would take the rest of the show. She, uh, <laughs> you have quite a bio uh, and background in autism research and development. And she's the author of this amazing book that I'm holding up in my hands. It is the Setting Up Classroom Spaces That Support Students with Autism Spectrum Disorders. And it would take us a week to go through her entire resume, but suffice it to say, she has not been sitting still idly. No. She's been working in this field for a long time. Uh, Susan, we're thrilled to have you. Should we be referring to you as Dr. Cabot? No, so okay. it's fine. Okay. Okay. Susan, tell us a little bit about the book and what is in, in the contents of the book and why it's important. Well, one of the areas that I feel is so important in terms of setting up classroom spaces uh, for our students on the spectrum, to me it's really a foundational part of an educational program. And uh, it's really, we found it to be really important and that when a classroom is well organized, everybody in the classroom feels better. The staff feel better, the students feel better, everything is where it's supposed to be, the learning centers are well defined so that children are not continuously trying to run out of them, the, teacher, the teachers have their materials arranged in the spaces that they're going to be using them. All the spaces are visually engineered so that whatever 
visual supports you need to support the children's communication are right there. Um, and we find that really it cuts down on a lot of behavioral issues in our children. That book really focuses on the physical environment itself, but we do feel that there are a lot of other organizational strategies in terms of the way the day is structured, the periods of learning, what kinds of activities are put into what blocks of time, uh, how the staff are zoned and organized in the classroom, where they're supposed to be, what students they're supposed to be assigned to, um, all of that kind of designed in advance so that our classrooms are not, uh, people are not kind of flying by the seat of their pants, that everybody is uh, organized and, and everything is structured. And you work closely with Christine Reeve, who we had on the show a couple of weeks ago, uh, who's the co-author for this wonderful book. Um, I, I'm just always stunned by the fact, I'm a former teacher, and I think a lot of times people don't understand how difficult being a teacher is, how many things there are that you have to, you have to be able to multitask in a way that I think would be stunning to the average person. And, and I think that people walk into a classroom and a lot of times if they don't have a background in education, they see chaos even though a lot of times it's very controlled chaos, that it's a teacher who knows, like if you said to her, I need you to find this one piece of information, a good teacher would be able to find it you know, very quickly because she's organized and, and knows where her stuff is. I'm saying she, but it could mm -hmm. be she or he. But, but a lot of times it is chaos because there are teachers who have just thrown things into a classroom and don't know where things are, and you can tell when you walk into a classroom by the children's behavior, how well the teacher has this classroom running. But explain that to people who don't understand. Uh, so, yeah. It's, it's interesting because I am responsible for a preschool program that has 16 classes for children with autism. And we have a model here, and there's a lot of consistency between the 16 classes. You walk into them, pretty much there are the same elements. They look pretty much the same. But it is interesting that different teachers bring different strengths to the position with them. And if we have a teacher who herself is not organized, then we either have to find teacher aides who are very organized, who can take on that role in the classroom, in this case, we had a teacher whose classroom just became very disorganized. There were two children that were assigned to that class that had very challenging behaviors. And so this weekend, I actually had a team of five of the support staff and the teacher come into the classroom, and it took us about five hours, but we re- we reset the classroom from top to bottom um, because the space wasn't working. The materials had become disorganized. The schedule wasn't working for the group of students that were in the class. And again, it's about, for me, starting from the bottom up. And that foundation really is that physical environment and so people don't realize what an impact that has and how much work it takes to actually get the classroom organized the way you want it to be organized you know we took out excess materials we moved materials we moved centers in the classroom and sometimes you have to move the space multiple times uh you know the furniture around in the space multiple times to really get it to kind of feel right so um, it is a, it's a big job to set up a classroom that really works for students on the spectrum. It, I, I can't even imagine how glorious that must have been for this teacher to have a team come in and, and have them reset her classroom. What did you see behaviorally from the kids in the classroom afterwards? Was it a ginormous shift? So it was, um, it, and it wasn't only a shift 
for the children, it was a big shift for the staff. Yeah. Um, we did it over the weekend on Saturday, and Monday, uh, everybody came into the classroom. At the end of the day, we had the staff, and this was a class that has three aides with the teacher and nine children. We brought everybody together, and, and we asked them, you know, what do you think went right? And they were so fast to say, you know, the space. The <laughs> space was so much better. The space worked right. We made the circle time area smaller. Uh, that worked better. We put it in the teacher had to be a little closer to the students. That worked better. Um, we rotated their centers so that there was less opportunity for the students to kind of escape between those centers as they were transitioning. And, you know, far and above, where last week the students had actually been kind of clearing surfaces and emptying shelves and throwing stuff around. And when you walked in the classroom midday, it looked like a tornado hit it. Uh, one of the aides said, at the end of the day, I just looked around the room and I'm like, I don't have anything to clean up. Yeah. Uh, whereas before they were just spending a lot of time putting stuff back, uh, now they didn't have to do that. It was like everything had a place. There was not as much stuff available to the students. The students were staying in their spaces more than just wandering and, and throwing stuff around. So the, the staff themselves recognized that big difference and the influence that had on the students' behavior. Absolutely. I wish we had more time because I have a strong sense that we could talk to you about anything and that you would have the answers like Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> but we're out of time. I want to say this, though. Um, if, if your child is in a classroom and you don't feel like things are everything that they could be, very lovingly get this book for your child's teacher and, and give this to them. It's available at all major booksellers, correct? You can get it on Amazon. Yeah. And... Uh -huh. Uh, great book. Once again, setting up classroom spaces that support students with autism spectrum disorders. With charts and pictures and very easy to read uh, chapters that can help any teacher to have their, their classroom run better. Um, definitely, we want to have you come back. We keep saying we're going to do an autism in the classroom uh, seminar, and we, we definitely want you guys to come back and, and do a whole uh, segment of that with us, and I'll be in touch with you to do that, okay? That would be great. All right. Okay, Thank, Susan. You so Thank you so much. For Happy us. holidays. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, wonderful guest that yeah. we had today. It's just been a lovely two hours being with you guys. We've got a big show tomorrow. Okay, tell us about it. And um, we, we've got a guest. Candace Pogge is going to be with us as our autism expert. She's going to be answering questions from you guys. We have um, Bonnie Yates, special education attorney, who's going to be with us. And then we have a dad who works in the field of radio uh -huh. who uh, is uh, well-known in Southern California who's going to be on the show talking about a song that he wrote for his son. I think you guys are all going to be really inspired by this wonderful wonderful autism dad. So that plus a mindfulness moment and maybe an autism in the classroom moment, we'll see how much we can jam into okay. one day. Sounds so good. all of that and much, much more happening tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me. And give yourselves a hug from me. All right. Bye-bye for, for now. Bye-bye for now.